Okay, this is chapter 11. This is an extension of chapter 10, which was about adults. This is about the older adults. Um, and sometimes they get categorized into <clears throat> the oldest old, which is 85 uh, plus years of age. So almost every speech and hearing professional will work at somebody from this age group. At some point and they are the fastest growing segment in this uh, American society and you can <clears throat> you can read the the um, uh, stats down below sometimes there's a misconception about this group that they're not tech savvy well I can say that <clears throat> many of these individuals have Facebook accounts and keep up with their grandkids that way especially if they live um, uh, at a distance from their family so some of the testing that we do, we test speech and hearing. We also test speech, uh, understanding uh, speech in noisy environments. This group, um, because they're older and there can be issues with the ear canal collapsing on each other, we call that a collapsing ear canal. So that's something we need to pay attention to when we test. Um, and most of a fair amount of these individuals have tinnitus, even if they don't have much hearing loss uh, to speak of. So when we test uh, patients in this oldest old group, um, uh, you need a little bit longer presentation time, a little slower speech recognition testing. Uh, you need to kind of adapt. Sometimes you have to remind patients uh, because this group you will at times see individuals with uh, cognitive issues like uh, memory, dementia, things like that. <clears throat> and so Frequent, um, uh, frequent instruction is often uh, required. Presbycusis is the uh, term we use for hearing loss due to aging. Of course, there's no medical treatments to reverse this. There you can see the incidence of presbycusis. Um, we know it happens. We know there are multiple sensory neural things that happen. We're not we don't have a definitive, this is what causes it, though. But here's what it looks like. Um, men typically have a higher degree of high-frequency loss, mostly because of uh, traditional work in, in noisy environments. May, uh, females do, too, but not to the same degree. And this high-frequency hearing loss really the inability to hear high frequency consonant sounds creates substantial difficulty hearing and noise. <clears throat> so if you do not treat presbycusis usually through hearing aids you can have all these negative consequences depression, paranoia, hopelessness, grief, withdrawing from social situations, cognitive decline. There's some work out of Johns Hopkins uh, the uh, researcher's name is Frank Franklin Lin, L-I-N, and he has done some <clears throat> large-scale studies to examine uh, what happens when people wear hearing aids and have hearing loss and people don't wear hearing aids and have hearing loss, and what they found is a strong correlation between cognitive decline um, and the lack of hearing aid use, and they haven't seen that same uh, pattern for people who do wear hearing aids. So you need to be caref careful. Hearing aids are not a treatment for Alzheimer's or cognitive decline, but they see better cognitive uh, outcomes <clears throat> um, with the use of hearing aids. Here's some common... Um, reports in the case history I can hear but I don't understand the reason they can hear but not understand things is their low frequency mid frequency hearing is pretty good normal close to normal and so they can hear some of those consonant sounds some of the the um, I'm sorry low frequency vowel sounds and lower frequency consonant sounds but there's higher frequency consonant sounds like the fricatives and affricates provide a lot of um, meaning to speech and so um, not being able to hear those obviously causes all of these problems okay so here's some uh, circular chain of events for older adults um, so at the core is social relationships 
uh, in the periphery you have withdrawal, negative reactions, emotional distress, and they kind of all cycle together. Um, <clears throat> they may have substantial frustration when they go um, in social situations, so many of them stop going to social situations, and that's where we come in. Uh, most of these folks live either in private residences, if they can maintain their independence, or nursing homes, assisted living uh, centers, and so um, in my practice we would go and, and, and do periodic visits to these places because some of them, some of these places provide transportation and others don't, so we would go periodically maybe once every month or so and do hearing aid checks for everybody there and, and if they if they wanted and um, it was a good chance to get out of the office and, and, and uh, provide a service that a lot of people needed but couldn't access. <clears throat> so when we talk about other impairments that accompany um, aging, one substantial impairment is visual impairment and I mean this just creates massive difficulties working with the hearing aids. I was just talking to somebody about telehealth, teleaudiology and I mentioned that I could not imagine some of these individuals trying to clean like trying to do specific things to fix their hearing aid. <coughs> Excuse me. For some people it's no problem. Others with their vision they will just break the hearing aid so it may be worth uh, not worth it to do the telehealth, teleaudiology kind of stuff. Arthritis, obviously difficulty with dexterity that can influence what hearing aid um, style we choose. Um, they might want a very small hearing aid, but if they have hands and fingers that look like that, they will struggle oftentimes getting the hearing aids in and out. You know, dealing with uh, dementia and other kind of uh, cognitive issues, um, you've probably talked about this in a lot, but there are substantial issues with um, individuals who are suffering from this kind of thing. In these cases, we always have the uh, family members come in to get instructions with hearing aids, how to use them, how to insert them. To assist, we also ask if the caregiver, if there's somebody that's in the home or in the, um, that can come and, um, and assist with those. So there are factors that are uh, involved in the motivation to use a hearing aid. Uh, degree of hearing loss, obviously people who have more hearing loss are more motivated because they miss out on more things. Their perceived self um their, their um, <clears throat> perceived communication difficulties and their self-concept. Um, a lot of times people will come in and say things like, yeah, I'm 90 years old, I'm probably only going to live a few more years, so I'm not getting hearing aids. And so those are some of the irrational type things. I mean, I shouldn't say it's irrational. It is, it is pragmatic, practical, right? But, <clears throat> um, but again, you try to obviously let them know that this is something that would still benefit it benefit them whether they lived one more year ten more years you just never know um, the number and the quality of their conversational interactions so some people say things like I go to church on Sunday and I go out to eat after that and doctor visits and that's it so that can affect their you know I don't need to hear I don't I can turn the TV up and that sort of thing and then physical health dexterity all of that all of those things play a role. <clears throat> Cochlear implants. Um, one of the limiting factors for cochlear implants is physical health. So if you have somebody that is 85, let's say, and in extremely good health, health and extremely active, uh, they can still um, uh, be approved for cochlear implants. Um, but there, there's a lot of factors that go into that. But physical health, if you're not physically healthy to undergo the surgery, uh, you will not receive a cochlear implant. So assistive devices, um, in addition to a hearing aid, um, can uh, increase the satisfaction and the outcome for individuals uh, for this group. Uh, we talked about FM systems. Again, they make they make everything connectable now. So there are devices that you can connect to your TV 
and it will stream Bluetooth directly from your TV, uh, that device into your hearing aid, so people can set the volume where they like. You have your volume set, and um, it's a great technology. They have microphones that you can wear, um, that you can take with you if you have, um, you know, if you're eating out at a restaurant and you're with one person, they can put the microphone on them and it'll transmit directly from the mic to your hearing aid. So lots of assistive devices that have increased the satisfaction of hearing aid use. Um, doing AR or having an AR plan in an institutional setting is tough because um, you have staff turnover, but those are the things that we typically would go in and try to train staff about, um, you know, where to put the hearing aids, how to care for them, how not to break them. Uh, oftentimes when um, I would see people in, uh, in, a, in a setting, so in a nursing home or assisted listing, uh, living place, when we would order the hearing aids or the molds, we would get their initials or their first name and their last initial on them. So that way, if there was confusion about whose hearing aid this was, um, it had their name on it. So that was helpful or initials. Um, and so um, you could also provide serial numbers and put it in the chart. They could always look and see whose hearing aid it was based on serial numbers. But this is very challenging, and I understand from from their perspective, the worker's perspective, they have a lot to do in addition to dealing with this. Um, some healthcare workers were better at it, others were not. Um, I think there's just a lot of variability and there are lots of hearing aids lost or damaged in these types of settings. <clears throat> and so uh, final things, working with these folks is very rewarding. Um, Sometimes we get more out of it than they do. You know, I've come to grow very, uh, grown very fond of patients, and um, so um, there's a. It, it's just a very, very rewarding um, population to work with. Uh, and sometimes, again, we're the only people they see for a while, so we can help. You know, increase their quality of life. You know, um, be that person to talk to them for a bit during the appointment, after the appointment. Um, and so that is it for chapter uh, 11.